Hey, good morning, church. It's so good to be with you uh, as you're gathered in homes around the city. Uh, just love being able to um, share with you in a kind of a more live format. I love being this side of the camera, by the way. As Brett said in his welcome, I was behind the cameras trying to push a button. I really had one job to do and I messed that up. I'm far more comfortable on this side and sharing with you this morning. So we're doing a, uh, a little mini series called The Launch of the Church, uh, which is really around the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost and how that mobilized and launched the church. Um, but to this morning, actually, I'm going to depart from that plan um, a little bit. So, so last week, as I spoke through the first part of Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost, uh, the plan was to kind of finish Peter's sermon today. And in fact, on Thursday, when we came to do this recording, so we still do a pre-recorded sermon just in case something goes wrong. So on Thursday, I actually did um, prepare and preach a sermon and recorded the sermon that uh, runs through the second part of Peter's sermon on Pentecost. Um, but I actually want to depart from that plan this morning, not because that sermon was bad or anything. Uh, in fact, I was pretty happy with it, um, but felt like just as it ended, I just really felt I needed to share something different this morning. Um, there's been kind of a, a weight bearing on me, on all of us, I think, and there's been some pretty deep learning that I've gone through in my own life. And I and I felt, man, you know, we're not in a very committed sermon series. And so perhaps this is just one of the best opportunities that I have uh, to really share with you uh, something that, that really relates specifically to what we're going through right now. So I want to touch on topics like uh, the pandemic, of course, um, the subject of religious gatherings and even the racial injustice that we've experienced just coming out of the United States. Um, and so I wanted to do that this morning, depart from the plan. So that sermon, by the way, the one going through the uh, second part of Peter's sermon is available uh, on the website. So you can go in and see that. Uh, but today I really want to share with you uh, just one thing I've been learning. Um, I've come to realize there is one way that we can process all that's going on around us. There's so much happening. You might think of those three things I mentioned, man, how are you going to tie them all together? What I've come to realize, there is one way, a biblical way to process all of our struggles, grief, pain, hurt, suffering, one way. And that one way is the way of lament, lament. Lament should be our first response to any kind of crisis or any event that causes pain or grief in our lives. So what is lament? I mean, it's kind of a biblical word, but I think you know what it means. It's this idea of a very passionate expression of pain or sorrow. Now, I had obviously heard about the subject of lament before. I know that most of the Psalms are Psalms of lament. I know there's an entire book of the Bible called Lamentations that is a book of lament. But to be honest, I've often or always avoided the subject of lament. I think, as I've started to realize, I think for a number of reasons. I think firstly, I've avoided lament because it just sounds too much like complaining. And that's what it's like, complaining, and no one likes a complainer, right? So I've avoided it because it sounds like complaining. Secondly, I think I've avoided it because it seems like a failure of faith. So if you're really bringing your grief and your doubts to God, it seems to me like that in a way then you're a kind of acknowledging that your faith is perhaps not strong enough. And I'm a pretty competitive person, so like admitting defeat is not really an option. So I think I've avoided it for that reason too. And I think I've avoided lament because it seems like a kind of passive withdrawal or repeat. And again, I'm a pretty action-oriented person. So if it's like a problem, I want to get in there and understand it, solve it, fix it, take action. That's one of the reasons I became an engineer in the first place. And so that's why I think I've avoided this huge subject of lament. And now I'm learning, and that's what I wanted to share with you. 
uh, this morning. And what I've learned about these three objections, I've learned that firstly, for one of them, I was half right. For the other then, I was completely wrong. And for the other, I was so wrong that in fact, the truth is the complete opposite of what I was thinking. So let me share that with you. So firstly, where I was half right is the idea that lament is complaint. And to be sure, it, it lament really is this idea. It's not unlike complaining because it is supposed to be a very raw, honest, passionate expression of all the pain or hurt or grief or suffering that we're going through. That's what it, it is. So for example, Psalm 44 is a classic psalm of lament. And verse 22 to 25, just um, listen to how raw and honest this is. It says, yet because of you, Lord, we are killed all day long. We're treated like sheep at the slaughtering block. Rouse yourself. Why are you sleeping, O Lord? Wake up. Don't reject us forever. Why do you look the other way and ignore the way we are oppressed and mistreated? For we lie in the dirt with our bellies pressed to the ground. Now tell us how you really feel, right? That is a raw, honest expression and of pain. And that's what lament is. It's kind of this outburst, this speaking out of what we're feeling when what we're feeling inside of us does not seem to make sense with what we know about God in the world. But that's half of it. That's where I was half right here. So lament is in that way a complaining, but lament is complaint enfolded with trust. Which leads me to the second part of what I'm learning about lament, that it has this trust element. A person who's lamenting is this raw, honest expression where things are just not tying up with what they thought they knew or have come to know about God. See, ultimately, when you're lamenting to God, when you're expressing how you feel, it's because you ultimately believe that He hears, He cares, and that he'll respond. If you did not believe that, if you didn't believe he heard or cared or that it was going to make any difference, why would you bother expressing it to him? So lament is this idea that, no, God is listening and he does care. As difficult as it is to reconcile what we're feeling with what we know about God, when we bring it to God, it is this expression, he's listening, he cares, and he can do something about it. It's not just that, but something that uh, Nat Schluter said on our webinar um, last week. He said that, that when you're lamenting something, what you're doing is you're mourning the loss of something good. And so in a way, lament is just another way of celebrating the good in something. So for example, if you're at a funeral and you're not really mourning, I kind of might indicate you never really liked the person, right? So but the mourning is an expression of just how good it, the gift that you had. And so when we're lamenting to God, we are mourning the loss of something good, ultimately acknowledging every good thing is from Him. That's why we're bringing it to God. And so I've heard it said that anyone can cry, but only Christians can lament. See, it really is this raw, honest expression of pain, but enfolded with trust. That ultimately, I know God's listening and I know He cares and I know He can intervene. Right, so it's this prayerful response with real emotion directed towards God, a God that we actually trust, but in this very moment can't see that. And that's what lament is. The third part that I think I got wrong, got so wrong, that in fact the truth is the complete opposite, is <laughs> lament is in fact not avoiding action. It's actually, if you think about it, a very willful 
very courageous willingness to embrace the deep brokenness of what's actually happening. If you think about this, sometimes when you just jump to action, that in itself can be an avoidance tactic. Right? Sometimes you just want to make yourself feel better that you're doing something and you just take little action. Right? And believing that it's making things better when it's really not. And so sometimes jumping to action can be the avoiding part, whereas lament is this willingness, this brave willingness to step in and feel and engage with the deep brokenness. I think sometimes, uh, you know, this idea of um, mission trips, right? And I, I don't know anything about Rosebank mission trips yet, but I know some that I've been a part of where you kind of step into an area of such brokenness and we don't really know what to do. So we just kind of do a few things uh, and, re and move away and we move away feeling good that we've done something, but really we haven't actually stepped into the brokenness. It's just busyness around brokenness. It's not really engaging with the brokenness. And so, so that's what lament does. Lament draws us into the heart of the the brokenness. So it's a necessary step before action happens. So that's me. So I was often just want to just jump into actions and want to fix things. But here's the thing. Often those actions and our words, when we just jump into solutions, may not actually be the kinds of actions God wants or done in the way that he wants them to be done or the time that he wants. But when we lament, so when we first step into the brokenness and wrestle with God about it, then he starts to shape us. And I believe a, very, a clarity comes to mind about the heart of the brokenness so that our actions can now be redemptive. In other words, lament is not avoiding action. What I've come to realize, it, it is a very necessary precursor to real redemptive action. Now, I want to apply this idea of, of lament, particularly in this time that we're in, to the pandemic, to religious gatherings, to racial injustice. But before we get there, I want to talk just a little bit about what uh, lament is or how the Bible teaches us how to lament. So I mentioned to you that the Psalms are mostly made up of Psalms of lament. And in fact, one out of every three Psalms is a psalm of lament, this really raw, honest expression of pain and wrestling with God. Jesus himself quoted psalms of lament quite often. Uh, perhaps the most famous of them was on the cross where he quoted Psalm 22 and he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And many other times, it's particularly when faced with struggle, Jesus quoted psalms of lament. Apostle Paul quotes Psalms of Lament. In fact, Psalm 44 that I read to you earlier, that really honest psalm, Paul quotes those exact words in Romans 8 uh, verse 26, which came up recently when we spoke about the victory of Jesus. And we are more than conquerors. He quotes that psalm of lament. So this is something we've got to, we've got to acknowledge and we've got to learn. <laughs> I mean, if you think about the difference between just crying and lamenting. So no one has to teach you to cry, but we all have to learn to lament. Now, when you look at the Psalms, it turns out there's a, there's a kind of common pattern to lamenting. And I want to take you through these stages of lament just really quickly. So four of them that we see. So firstly, lament is, starts with talking to God. Secondly, bring your complaints. Third, ask boldly. And fourth, choose trust. So the first is just really obvious. Talk to God. Bring this to God. So Psalm 77. Now the classic Psalm of Lament, verse 1, says this. I cry aloud to God. Aloud 
to God and He will hear me. Sometimes I think we complain and we vent to everyone else and never to God. We'll just spread it on Facebook, all of our outrage, all of our venting, WhatsApp forward messages, but we never talk to God about the pain and the brokenness that we're either seeing or experiencing ourselves. Why don't we do that? Why don't we first talk to God about things? Well, I think it's because silence is often easier. I mean, think about it in the context of your relationships. You know, sometimes like if something's really bothering you, you just don't understand and you're quite upset. I know oftentimes I'll just like choose like silence. It's just easier to not say anything. And let me ask you this. When has giving somebody the silent treatment ever helped anyone? Ever. <laughs> Never. Let me ask you. Have you perhaps been giving God the silent treatment? But because it's just easier. And you'll express all the pain and the hurt. Maybe it's a particular grief you're going through, or a doubt that you have, or some expression of anger against something that's happening in your life. And you'll talk to everybody else about it, but not to God. Here's the thing. He already knows you're struggling. Right? He knows we're struggling. So just bring it to him as hard as it is and listen learning to lament especially for somebody like me and maybe like you as hard as lament is it's better than faking it and it's better than avoiding wrestling with God about the deep struggles that you're going through so that's the first thing it's just quite obvious talk to God about it. And perhaps just one of the things I want to say is in the midst of this pandemic and lockdown and all that's going on, at the very, the, the very least you should be doing is talking to God, talking to Him constantly about what you're feeling and what you're experiencing. If you do nothing else, just resolve today to talk to God. That's the first step of the meant. Bring it aloud to Him. The second is then to bring your complaint. So verbalize it. And I gave you an example of that, but let's carry on with Psalm 77. It carries on and says this. Now, just as I read the psalm to you, just think about the questions this person is asking of God. Right? Will the Lord spurn forever? Is he going to ignore me forever? And will he never again be favorable toward me? Is this it? Am I done with the goodness of God in my life? Has his steadfast love forever ceased. I mean, and as Christians, we know, and that doesn't make any sense. Steadfast love is steadfast. But sometimes it feels like that, doesn't it? It's dried up. You just can't love me anymore. That's what this, this psalmist is verbalizing. Are his promises at an end for all time? These are, not, these are words of the Bible. Has God forgotten to be gracious? I mean, as if, as if God has to think about being gracious, as if he has to decide, in this moment I'm going to be gracious. No, he is gracious, but this is how it sometimes feels. That's what lament is, when what we're going through just does not reconcile with what we do know about God. And so it's this honest bringing it before him. You can see in the background of the psalmist's mind is, I know he's gracious. I know his, his love is steadfast. I know his promises are eternal and sure, but it doesn't feel like it right now. And then he goes on and says, has he in anger shut up his compassion? Have you ever prayed like that? And let's be honest, like in churches, do we pray like that often, if ever? Just one note of caution here. Remember, complaining is not the end goal. We're not complaining in order to complain. We're complaining in order to move us closer to God. It's a very necessary part of this process, but it's not the end of the process. This is not an excuse to just kind of wallow in self-pity, but it must be this honest expression of exactly what we're feeling. So talk to God. Bring the complaint. And thirdly, ask boldly. 
And so this language of lament is so interesting because it's just, it's, it's not timid. It's very raw. It's, it's a wrestling. It's bold. And so there's this honest expression of complaint. And on top of that, add in these bold prayers, big requests. And here's the thing. We pray differently when we're hurting. And so Psalm 44, again, those words, wake up, why are you sleeping? If anything, this pandemic, if, if, if it should have taught us anything, it should have taught us to pray boldly. Now is not a time for timid, politically correct praying. But in times of hurt and pain, lament just brings a boldness. And we've, we've lost opportunity now to learn to pray boldly. And then lastly, he says, uh, the last part of lament is to choose trust. Remember, that's, that's what lament is. It's complaining, honestly, uh, you know, um, robust asking, but enfolded with trust. And so choose trust. It's remarkable how many of these psalms of lament, as I mentioned, over like 50 of them, um, how many of them there's a turning point, a very clear a kind of venting and then a turning point. And you often notice that by words like but or yet or then. And the whole tone of the psalm changes. Not every time, but most times. So for example, again, Psalm 77, if we carry on with that, verse 10. But right after those honest questions comes this but then I said, I will appeal to this, to the years of the right hand of the Most High. And just by the way, that's what the sermon recorded on Thursday was all about, what the right hand of God is. And so he's bringing to mind, I will appeal to this, the years of how I've seen God act on my behalf. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. And it goes on to describe the Exodus event, which was for them the formative deliverance, salvation story. And I think it's so helpful, like in our lamenting and in our pain and in our doubts, to remember the good that God has done. Every single Christian has a story of the steadfast love of God in their lives. Every single Christian can say, but Jesus, yet Jesus. Every Christian has that. We have a massive deliverance salvation story. We spent 10 weeks talking about that. No matter what's going on, we should always step back and remember what God has done in Jesus, our primary salvation story. That's what fed the psalmist's turn around. Yeah, and then I remember Jesus. And then I remembered my salvation, my ultimate deliverance. And so again, just like practical advice for us. If anything, these days, just keep talking to God. And if anything, these days, be ending those prayers with, I choose to trust you. I choose to. It's not making sense. Hey, we're not avoiding those difficult questions. I don't yet understand it, but I choose to trust you these days. So that's, I think, just a really quick summary of what lament is and how we should lament. I want to spend just a little bit of time now applying it to particular circumstances of lament. And there's, and there's so many, right? So, I mean, the first is the pandemic. Our response to this pandemic, our first response should have been to lament. And I know I'm really guilty of this. And, and that's not to say that, I, that I've been like, you know, immune or impervious or just like so hard hearted that I haven't felt like, no, like my very closest friend has lost his job right before lockdown and the loss of life added up. Prayer breakout room, you know, just last week, there was somebody there from Rosebank who had lost their father due to COVID-19. And it's not like, you know, I'm unaware that that's going on, but I, I think despite realizing what's happening, I've just maintained this kind of positive outlook that everything's going to be okay. And it is going to be okay. 
and we know it's going, we're going to come out of this. But our first response should have been lament. And just think about this. This is such a unique time in the history of the world that we're all going through the same thing. And you know what? In fact, we are all mourning the loss of something. So, in fact, I first came across that. I was reading a, a tweet, but it was actually by a, uh, a mountain biker. And she's like, she was like a world champion. I mean, at the beginning of, of this, she tweeted about, hey, just let's be gracious with everyone because everybody's mourning the loss of someone. And I didn't realize just how true those words were. Everybody's mourning the loss of something, whether it's the loss of your job or loss of income or the loss of life. Or the loss of dreams. That's what she was referring to. Like these athletes preparing for the Olympics and they give up their lives and now they dream. The loss of dreams. And you had plans this year. And maybe these great plans, holidays or how you were going to study. And you mourning the loss of like opportunity for education. Or mourning the loss of relationships. Because of how difficult things Everybody in the world right now is mourning the loss of something. So never before have we needed so desperately the language of lament because of the profound loss, pain, never mind the doubts that are creeping up inside of us. That should have been our first step to have lamented. Secondly, I want to talk a little bit about the subject of religious gatherings. You might think that's such a strange thing to bring up in this context, uh, but I bring it up because, well, I mean, people have been asking because we're allowed to gather in 50s, so will we be gathering? And, and to be honest with you, the first time I came across the word lament in this season, I was on a webinar and I was a panelist. I was first to speak and the guy interviewing asked me, hey, so you started your job at this new church. Um, how's that been in the, in, like, in the midst of lockdown? And I just, I spoke just about how I, you know, struggled with the fact that we're not gathering together, that what I really missed was the gathering on a Sunday. And one of the other panelists just straight away said, yeah, it's right that we lament and we mourn the loss of something that is so good. And I mean, what I was saying on that panel is how much, you know, I missed not just the macro interaction. So the kind of adrenaline of preaching to lots of people and singing with hundreds of other voices. But I missed also the micro interactions. You know, like when you drive up to church on a Sunday and you park your car, or even as you're driving in, you see somebody and you wave. There's an awesome parking people that help you at Rosebank, right? And they give you a friendly wave. And then you get out your car and you see somebody and you greet them. And even if you don't know them, it's like, it's like the, the nod of acknowledgement, right? And you kind of walk in and you've got the guys at the door just so friendly greeting you. You sit down, there's people around you and you're acknowledging, you chat, even if it's small talk. And then there's the big stuff, the preaching and the worship and the prayer. And then maybe at the end, like you go outside, maybe chat to somebody that you know, and you talk and you share a bit of your struggle. And maybe they offer to pray for you. Micro interactions, which since we've come church online, we just haven't been able to do, which really is why we're doing this. The importance of these little interactions, your little being live here and checking in and commenting and saying hello, can underestimate that. So when the president announced that, hey, we can gather in groups of 50, I mean, it threw me because on the one hand was the opportunity to experience this all again, not just the big things, but the small things that add up that mean so much to our experience of being in community. I thought, well, he has a chance on the one hand, but on the other hand, quite quickly realizing that that would be not responsible and perhaps to our own people or loving for the community uh, and never mind the insane logistics behind trying to, you know, cater to a church of a thousand with gatherings of 50. And so I think we quickly realized we weren't going to be able to do anything. And a lot of churches have, I think, come to that same conclusion. But the problem is, for me, uh, uh, that was quite a quick decision for a lot of people and for s some churches. And for me, no, we, must, we should lament, lament this loss of something good of gathering together. 
as amazing as this is, and as we've tried to bring these micro interactions and, and, and preaching, we will never be an online only church, will we? And so in some ways, I think we can't get just too comfortable with this. Right? So it's a mourning, lament. I feel like we need to lament even gathering as a church. And then, and then lastly, on a completely different scale, it's so important. The last thing that really actually just finally got me on this track of lament has been the it's an incredible, devastating news just coming out of the U.S. around racial injustice. And I think I very quickly realized then that our first response meant anybody, anywhere, really should be, should have been lament. And if I could be honest with you, when I first saw that news coming out, in fact, it was even last week, Sunday, I was driving here and in the car with Kristen and she's from the States and I was just talking to her uh, about it. My first response, if I'm honest, was, man, I'm so glad that we don't have to deal with that here. Like, I'm so glad that as a country we've moved past this. And then I realized a conversation with someone really close to me, person of color, who just shared how that news even here brought up this, those same feelings, how it made them feel, and this same sort of fear and anger started to come out. And immediately I realized I've missed something here. I treated that as just an event, whereas really it's, it's not about the event. And we on the side, we don't understand the complexities of a particular event. But what it is about is this real, particular, deep brokenness, this sin of racism, which is something that we absolutely should lament. And maybe we become a little complacent with. And lament, not just the events, but this sin, this particular brokenness, which we spoke about not, not even a month ago when we spoke about how Jesus broke down the dividing wall of hostility between racial groups, right? how that was not a side effect, it was not an effect, it was a direct consequence of his death. He intended to break down that wall of hostility. And I think we even spoke about how when we then rebuild dividing walls of hostility, or when we see hostility erupting around that, that should be something we lament because Jesus died to break that down. And so I think as difficult as it is sometimes for us uh, to get our minds around it, it really it's, it's, it comes down, not again, not to an event, but brokenness, a particular devastating brokenness. And when we lament, here's the point, when we lament and lament this, I believe so much else happens inside of us. So firstly, when we enter into this brokenness, and so for me it was realizing, no, it's not over there, it's still here and it's still in me. So when we lament, truly, courageously enter into wrestling with God exactly how we're feeling, firstly, we start to see our own brokenness. And we start to see our brokenness around many forms of prejudice. I mean, that's one thing, I think, as we enter into lamenting this, is we start to see our particular prejudices around so many things. Perhaps around age, where we look down on those younger or older, or gender, or wealth, or education. Right? The book of James opens with the story of the church uh, welcoming the rich and kind of putting the poor to the side, a form of prejudice. So many forms of prejudice. See, and if we just kind of keep it at bay and jump to action and jump to just saying things and don't fully embrace the real brokenness, then we'll never see that inside of us. But when we lament, when we engage with God over this brokenness, prejudice, we start to see, as I start to see, just so many different ways 
that we're prejudiced. So that's the first thing is that it reveals our own brokenness. But then secondly, we start to truly empathize. Truly empathize. Perhaps more than ever, and perhaps in this particular form of brokenness, we have the opportunity to live out Romans 12 verse 15, which says rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. And even if it's not our own tears, but weeping with them for those who are weeping, perhaps one of the greatest gifts that we can give in times when a particular group of people, whether it's ours or another's, is really suffering. The greatest gifts that we can give is deep empathy. That's not possible without lament. It's just patronizing otherwise. And then thirdly, I think the language of lament really helps us build a bridge of unity. And I truly believe this because the language of lament is so robust. It's big enough to hang, handle anger and this venting and frustration. Only the language of lament is robust enough to handle this. And so when we engage in lament, we actually have the opportunity to truly build something that is unifying. Now, just hear me clearly. I don't, lament is not the final solution. That, that's not what's going to solve all the problems. Jesus, the blood of Jesus, forgiveness, the gospel taking root and flourishing is what solves. But lament is a very necessary precursor to redemptive action, especially in this conversation. Because otherwise words or speech rhetoric just becomes platitudes and actions become activism. And they lack any real weight or substance or power. But when we lament, when we first go through lament, it changes the tone and perhaps even changes the very actions that we do and the words that we speak. So church, this is a time to lament, to mourn loss, mourn brokenness in so many ways. And so I want to lead us in a prayer of lament. And to do that, all I'm going to do is read Psalm 13. It's a classic psalm of lament. And just encourage you to where you are, like if you need to be quiet and silent and just listen to the scripture or to engage with it in a way where you are going through these four steps of talk to God about it. Bring the complaint, ask boldly and choose trust. Perhaps one of the most transformative things that we can do as a church in this time is to lament together. So let's try and do that, even if it is virtually. So let's pray. And I'm going to read Psalm 13. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day long? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? And so church, maybe you want to just take those words and add your situation. You feel like maybe God has forgotten you or hidden his face from you. Or there's a sorrow in your heart or you feel like an enemy and not maybe for you a particular person but in general the struggle the obstructions in your life just seems like they're prevailing you're not making any ground against a particular difficulty consider and answer me O Lord my God, light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death, lest my enemies say I've prevailed over him, lest my foes rejoice because I'm shaken. To God we pray, would you consider 
our requests. And church, I just encourage you, and this is where you are in your heart, or if you're alone out loud, or if you're comfortable out loud, wherever you are, to just express that. What are you asking God for in the midst of difficult circumstances? Answer us, O oh God. Hear our prayers. God, we pray for deep unity in our church, in our country. And God, we pray that this pandemic, Lord, we pray for your hand to intervene for all those in our church that have suffered loss, economically loss of jobs. God, would you comfort them and would you bring about, would you bring your provision You've promised us, and we, even though it may not seem like it, we choose to trust in your promises that we don't have to worry about what we're going to wear, eat, or drink. And as you clothe the flowers of the field, so you will provide for us. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. And my heart shall rejoice in your salvation. And I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Amen. How's that for transition? But I've trusted and I will now sing to the Lord. And I think we can have an opportunity to do just that as we sing together before Brett comes and closes the service.